Hey everybody, welcome to Chapter 8 Lecture. Um, this lecture is on creating a new people, expanding the country. And we're focusing, as you can see, the years 1801 to 1823. Um, these are really important um, two decades in American history that really sets the tone of where we go from here as far as um, how we develop in our infancy as a brand new country. As we've talked about in class, we know that Jefferson has been now elected president, and he brings this whole new Republican ideal to America. And for the first time in American history, which is not super significant to say because, well, America is not that long, has not been around that long, but I guess if you think about it in the perspective of what we've been through as a country up to this point, we've been through a lot of shifts, ideals, um, we've gone through a lot of changes and some growing pains. And so we see uh, what it's like for American democracy to shift its leadership ideal to a new political party. And so Thomas Jefferson is elected and he sets a new tone for the federal government. He has an entire different philosophy than that of um, any, any, any of the other two presidents up to this point. We see that um, Jefferson, he really becomes uh, ideologically a political leader. And I think it's interesting that the presentation puts this as its very first bullet point. So we have this famous, uh, probably the most important Supreme Court case, and I'll explain why here in a second, Marbury versus Madison. Well, William Marbury sued the Secretary of State James Madison um, to deliver his commission as Justice of the Peace in Washington, D.C. And so this came up with this question of, well, who decides what's constitutional? We have this new constitution. How do we know if we're following that constitution? And so Marbury versus Madison sets this, this new precedence that the United States Supreme Court is the, the body that checks and balances our government by deciding whether or not the laws that are passed are constitutional. And so our Supreme Court still today, when they decide on cases, they're simply looking at the appeal of whether or not const the Constitution has been followed and if individual rights within the Bill of Rights and the Constitution have also been provided for. And so with this new precedence, this really empowers the Supreme Court on a whole new level. And it, it defines it in a way that is meaningful to us today. And with this new uh, found power of the, the Supreme Court, this kind of coincides with you know, where Jefferson is headed politically. When we look at when Jefferson took office, the population of the United States was only 5.3 million people. Almost 900,000 of them were African slaves. That's a pretty significant portion of the population of the country. 90% of the white population were farmers, lived on, farmer, uh, lived on farms, and they were pretty agrarian in their lifestyle. They took care of themselves. This rural America also has seen in the Hamilton Bird Duel. Um, as we talked about in class about our election, um, Hamilton and Burr went out and uh, if you can think about a future president fighting on the streets in a duel, it almost seems like a, a tall tale of American history, but it happened and resulted in Burr losing his life. Um, from our text, we can see that um, there's some important information to be drawn from this learning objective. And I like the question that it, does, it poses. It says, Jefferson called his election the Revolution of 1800. It's interesting if we compare modern politics today. We have candidates that refer to themselves as revolutionary. So I guess 
the answer to this or the argument here that starts to become is how we define a revolution. But outside of that, in Jefferson's mind, with what has been going on in the agrarian ideal and the rural America at the time with the change of the Supreme Court, there's a revolution that's happening in the early 1800s. So considering the changes in the government during his administration, well, do you agree with him? Why or why not? So let's look at some important points as you formulate your own opinion on that. Jefferson made several changes in the government. And when you make changes in government, it's going to impact the rest of the nation. But you have to remember his political ideology was a very small government, one where uh, white males and property owners got uh, the voice in America, and one where it was kind of all men, all men for themselves in the sense that they took care of themselves. And um, so he prioritized social equality specifically for white males. And he did advocate for individual freedom. He didn't like social hierarchy so much. It was not about uh, climbing the ladder. It was not about uh, social justice and equality. It was about taking care of yourself. And as we've talked about in class, Jefferson may or may not agree, but uh, the more economically independent you are, the more free you are as a people. And uh, so I think Jefferson understood this to the principle where if you took care of your house and your home and your needs, you would in increase your individual freedom. He believed in a very limited government and believed in giving more power to the states. You have to remember, this is the man who wrote the Declaration of Independence. Um, I can understand why he would want to give more power to the states, especially as he was at the forefront of the battle for independence. He set the tone for republicanism and was the one that, and that started to sweep the country, emphasizing equality and independent decision-making among citizens. I also think that's an interesting phrase. Think about 2016 today. Are people independent decision makers? I think some would argue that we're really not as we rely so much on social media and the 24 hour news cycle and our opinions are often tailored to us to, to attract us to those, those methods of, of receiving information. Um, T Jefferson was a very uh, passionate man about educating himself and being responsible and taking ownership of his own education. And so he said that about the people of America, too. It's not the government's job to make your decisions. Your decisions need to be yours and independent. And so one of the things he did is he cut the number of people working in the federal government in an effort to prevent it from growing too big and powerful. And uh, I honestly can't say that I know uh, well enough to say how big the federal government was, but I can tell you it's substantially smaller than it ever has been in modern America, and yet it was still too large for them at that time. Um, so he reduced the standing army. Now, in today's Republican ideal, many Republicans support the idea of a large standing army, um, and he feared a large standing army, so he reduced it by half. He abolished all internal taxes, and he virtually um, all property qualifications for voting disappeared, widening the political base. Uh, again, going back to his ideology of individual freedom and individual decision making. Now, in the 1800s, there were some other, there's another side to the coin, and in this case, the nickel. Slavery continued, and in fact, it grew as an institution. Jefferson did not love slavery. He disliked it. Um, and a lot of people questioned him on that because he relied heavily on his own slaves that he owned. Although white men gained more rights and greater equal status, slaves and women remained inferior in significant ways. Important Federalist contributions like the National Bank and the tariff remained in place. 
And so you can see with some of the environment of politics in 1800 how that might clash and be revolutionary to a certain degree with what Jefferson brought to the office of the presidency and to his influence on America. Um, but I'll, I'll leave that for us to discuss later on. Do you think it was revolutionary? This gives you a good base of information to be able to argue for or against that. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was also uh, supported the ideal of religious freedom. And you can imagine as a founding father himself, understanding the importance of religious freedom in early, early American history. Um, but he believed in a separation between church and state. And he advocated for that, to be religiously free, and that it was not the government's role to infringe on that in any way. So he at James Madison uh, went to the Virginia legislature, uh, who was publicly financing the Episcopal Church. And they, they battled over that and fought. In the end, they won. Um, and eliminated the idea that, that states could support specific churches. Um, it was also fought in, in Connecticut. Um, during this time of religious freedom, now more than ever, a, a separation of church and state, we see new religious ex expression. The Second Great Awakening takes place where uh, countless churches and organizations start to preach and go throughout the, Amer uh, the new America. And people become more religious again than they ever have in the past. And it starts to sweep through America in a great way, causing the birth of um, the, the many Christian churches we have today. America has many different denominations. In fact, thousands are created every year because people are religiously free to practice and worship without government infringement. Um, we see Methodists, Baptists, and other Protestants. Um, some f names that you'll read in your primary sources, uh, John Wesley and Francis Asbury, despite their differences, um, the Methodist and the Baptist ministers were highly effective in changing the country. This was directly tied to that Second Great Awakening, as we see the growth of Methodist, Baptists, and Protestants. Where we know from early American uh, history, when the First Great Awakening and people separating themselves from the state-run Anglican Church, as well as other uh, government sponsored the Catholic Church and other uh, that became oppressive and powerful to people. Um, plantation owners started to organize religious services for slaves. Um, unfortunately, it had not the intent that you would think a church would have. It was to help them understand, quote unquote, the virtues of submission and obedience. Uh, slaves passed along me uh, memories of another form of worship. Congregations met often night in secluded places so they too could worship as they felt it was necessary. So this right did not extend uh, again to these minority groups. American Catholic and Jewish communities um, was not a very big presence in the New Republic. During the late 1700s and early 1800s, the largest number of Catholics in North America lived in New Orleans. And most of the American Jews lived in the East Coast cities. And that had a lot to do with the early immigration. Um, which brings us to another objective tied question. How does this trend towards religious freedom epitomize the Republican value of the Jefferson administration? meaning Jefferson was an important president as far as religious freedom is concerned. And he believed that politics, again, and religion should remain in separate spheres, that there should be a wall of separation between church and state. And, it, and he urged states with established religions to end support for those religions and to let people worship to the degree that they wish to do. Religious freedom allowed new churches to flourish, emphasizing the independence of choice and equality. The Second Great Awakening is tied directly to that. Methodists emphasized the same theories as Jefferson administration. Um, and other churches supported that as well. 
that individuals need to be free to make their own decisions. I really, regardless of the religious aspect, I love the idea that we are free to be individual thinkers. And I hope we don't lose that. Um, within established religions, like the Baptists, there were many different groups from which to choose from. And as we just mentioned, slaves were meeting in secret. Um, and all across the board, people are gaining more religious experience in America. And it has a lot to do with the fact that the government is out of the picture. Another part of the first two decades of that 19th century, and um, very much attributed to Thomas Jefferson, is we start to look at expanding our country. And you'll see here on this map the famous Louisiana Purchase, or the Louisiana Territory, which extends um, right there on the border of Michigan and Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Mississippi, and extends significantly west, north, and south. This area occupied by the French. And the Louisiana Purchase is, I don't know if it's the single greatest accomplishment, We've talked about some pretty significant things, but I guess if you, from an administrative perspective, that could be correct. Um, that, that's a debatable statement, but it definitely is one of his more famous accomplishments. Um, in 1800, Louisiana transfers from uh, Spain to Napoleon and France. Um, and in 1803, Thomas Jefferson gets the deal of a century and even probably forever, where he doubles the size of the United States. Now the equivalent, if I remember right, in today's dollars was about 250 million. To put that in perspective, we spend over $4 billion to manufacture one aircraft carrier today in our Navy. So I'd say it was a pretty effective economic deal. Um, the city of New Orleans was unusual for an American city as we, when we absorbed the Louisiana Territory, it became part of the United States in 1803. And a lot of the inhabitants there spoke French or Spanish because of the, the early settlers. And now it's in a country where business is conducted in English. It was a mainly Catholic city where we tie back to see those Roman Catholics lived uh, a lot in New Orleans, and that is why. To help us better understand this new territory, Thomas Jefferson um, commissions the famous Lewis and Clark expedition from 1804 to 1806. Meriwether Lewis and William Clark set out west and they continued on and not only did they uh, look at the Louisiana territory, but they went all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And so this brings us to an important thought-provoking question. What key aspects of the Louisiana Purchase were of particular importance to the United States? And how would they change life for different groups of Americans? The face of America starts to change as we grow and expand. We have new languages and religious differences. We are starting to change and become individual as Thomas Jefferson visioned. The importance of the United States was access to a port, New Orleans, New Orleans a, a huge hub for shipping and trade, as its geography indicates. Western farmers gained access to fertile land west of the Mississippi. And that is a very important statement to the vision of Thomas Jefferson. You have to remember how we started a few minutes ago talking about his idea of an agrarian small government that the government does not make these big decisions. And yet that same president spends government money, even though it was a great deal to purchase a huge part of land. Some argue that that is not constitutional. The president does not have the authority to just go buy a bunch of land. Um, but thus this small agrarian, small government-minded president did that. But his reasoning for that is now we have so much more land, people are more free to thrive on more fertile land, spread out across our country, and it's less competitive. You can sustain yourself with all this land. You can be a farmer, you can have a profitable land, and you can thrive in this version of America. And so in, in on the flip side, 
he made a fantastic decision for the economic prosperity of Americans that was in line with his agrarian vision. Um, let's look at how the Louisiana Purchase changed people's lives and how that, to answer the latter part of the question, changed a life for groups of different types of Americans. Well, if you were agriculture, uh, or, uh, had agricultural interest or wanted to be a plantation over, you now had an immense amount of fertile land that was not available to you before. So immediately an economic benefit. Um, when we expand farming, however, that then has an increased demand on slavery. So landowners need more labor, um, which is probably an important aspect to the growth of the slave and African population that leads us eventually to questioning slavery, even more than we have before. And America grows richer. When you are economically free, you become freer as a nation. And as a result, traders and merchants also become more wealthy as there's more people to trade with, there are new industries other than farming, such as fur trade. As you know from earlier, the fur trade and the French were instrumental in why they uh, inhabited North America to begin with. We see difference in lifestyle and culture. Um, American shippers had better and more direct trade routes. So there were some social trade-offs, but there were some economic benefits as well. And so it changed people's lives for good and for bad. And it does have positive and negative effects as we go further into our, American, our America's history. This brings us, as we get closer to uh, about halfway through this time period that we're talking about, um, England declares war on us on the famous War of 1812. Um, this becomes the less known second war for independence. Um, Federalists and New England oppose this war. Um, and uh, here are the main three causes of why this war started. Britain was interfering with trade on the high seas. They still uh, were imperialist in that they occupied the world seas. Um, and they were economically affecting us once again. They enticed Indian attacks on Americans as a result of the tensions of the French-Indian War before. And that then also resulted in increased tensions between whites and Indians, which is nothing new going forward. You see a famous name there, a governor of, in 1811, William Henry Harrison. Um, he goes after those Indians and decides that they need to be stopped. Some of the consequences of the War of 1812. Um, in 1814, the British attack Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. They burned the White House, the Capitol, and government buildings. Um, and there was also a battle in New Orleans. So this was, you know, a modern day attack. Uh, you know, if we look at modern day terrorism today, I don't know if that qualifies as the same thing, uh, but it was an attack on our nation and a war began. So the best way to look at this war is through the lens of a question. Why did the War of 1812 and the events leading up to it split the nation? And based on those events, did Madison make the right decision? Well, the causes of the War of 1812, we just talked about that. Britain and the United States never were at peace. There was probably some hard feelings over the the loss of the Revolutionary War. Even though treaties were signed, they were not respected. Uh, in its war with France, the British largely engaged in seizing American ships on the seas, and we didn't like that. Jefferson um, instituted his famous Embargo Act, which failed to, not only failed to hurt Britain, but it was also very detrimental to our United States economy. And then, of course, we had some tensions with the Native Americans as we just talked about. And so some of the effects uh, split over the Ad Embargo Act led to further discussions of states' rights and succession. And Connecticut and Massachusetts 
they declared the embargo illegal in their states. And so there, again, this question of, of republicanism and of this idea, is this going to work? Um, as I skip down to some of this, it really comes down to who we are as a people and what is the role of government. And did they make the right decision? I think because America stayed intact and because America was able to benefit in a way uh, that showed its strength and its independence yet again in a second trial, it in fact was pretty effective in helping us to better define ourselves. It also helped us to expand. And so you can see that unorganized uh, Louisiana territory and um, you have the Oregon country up there. Now the Spanish territory is what America looks like by 1823. So it brings Florida and Oregon into question. As we move through our presidencies, we're now at Andrew Jackson. He takes Florida in 1817. Um, the U.S. obtains Florida, and the Spanish rights to the Oregon Territory are then transferred to the United States. And then we see the famous Monroe Doctrine start to come into play, um, where we henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European power. Hands off. This is ours. And this idea of growth and manifest destiny start to take place. So we'll finish with this question. How did the outcome of the War of 1812 allow the U.S. government to pursue its expansionist goals and issue the Monroe Doctrine? Well, after the War of 1812, we got more land. We continued to grow and secure additional rights on the seas, which reduced threat. America starts to become a pretty global power. The battles that the U.S. won in 1812, particularly the one in New Orleans, gave us even additional respect not that we needed a whole lot, in my opinion. We just defeated their empire once, but now twice. And we got rid of those threats from the French and the British. And now we are pretty much set to be a pretty powerful large nation. And so we implement this idea of Monroe Doctrine, where we are going to claim that we are the biggest influence, and Europe is going to stay hands off, and the hemisphere is ours to take. Which slingshots into a strong manifest destiny, a growth of America. And I want to just wrap this back to the ideal of Thomas Jefferson of what he brought, individual free thinkers. Um, politically, there's always things to be questioned in American history. But ideologically, have we done a good and effective job of promoting this democratic republic ideal? It has seen some tests. And it has thrived in some areas and taught us some important lessons. And so while no presidency is perfect, I'd look to Thomas Jefferson and think about his philosophy and see where uh, it inspires you and where you come in line with that. And how do you think that is going to affect the future of American history that, that you're learning about?